All right, so um, the last lesson of biology, we're going to continue with plants. And yesterday we talked about plant tissue, okay, what plants are made of. Today we're going to talk about two important tasks that plants need to do. And the first one is how they transport water and nutrients throughout its body. And second is how it reproduces. So with regards to plant transport, we're going to have to talk about the stem, the roots. And for uh, reproduction, we're going to focus on flowers and pollination. So let's start uh, with the stem. Okay, so we talked about the stem already. Um, it has two main functions. One is to, to support the plant, just make, make sure that it is upright and standing. Uh, that is one of the uh, functions. The other one is to suck up water from the ground and absorb the water everywhere else. So it is like the blood vessels. Okay, so within the stems, you have the vascular bundle. And we talked about the vascular bundle they are comprised of the xylem and the phloem. Uh, the xylem are made up of dead cells that transport water and minerals, and phloem are made up of living cells that transport uh, hormones and food. Okay, so if you slice a plant down the middle and you look at the stem, uh, this is a real photo, by the way, and you're going to see something like that. And I circled in green uh, one unit of the vascular bundle, and the vascular bundle goes around the stem, kind of like a clock. So you can see that there are many vascular bundles, and within it you have the xylem and the phloem. Okay, and the rest of it is just ground tissue. The skin is on the outside. And the roots we mentioned from last class, um, they have multiple functions. One is to anchor the plant so that the plant doesn't tip over. Uh, like the picture on the left, you have a tree with many roots so that the tree is stable. Okay. Another function is to absorb water, obviously, which is the one that we're going to talk about today. And obviously, a third one is to store nutrients, like a radish or a carrot. Uh, the flesh that you eat from a radish and carrots are the roots. Okay, so that's just a quick recap of the stem and the root. So, let's focus on plant transport. Animals, like you and me, uh, we have a heart, okay? And our heart is constantly pumping. Our heart is a muscle that acts like a pump. So every time your heart beats, it pumps blood throughout your body. So even if... Um, if you don't do anything, you can be in any position. Everywhere in your body will get a constant supply of blood because a pump is actively pumping the blood. Plants don't have that. Okay, plants do not have pumps. So how do they get water um, to flow everywhere throughout their body? So how can water fight against gravity? Because gravity wants to pull everything down. So how does water get up? Okay, so here is a huge problem. How do they get water into the leaves, which are usually really high up, and they need lots and lots of water. So there must be a force or many forces together uh, that overcomes gravity and pulls water upward. And this is basically uh, plant transport. This is actually quite complicated. Um, in the picture here, it basically summarizes everything about plant transport. All right, so th the story is water goes from the soil all the way to the tip of the tree. How? Well, look closely at those pictures. Starting from the bottom, uh, water is absorbed from the soil into the roots. Okay, this is... Uh, something that the roots do. They simply absorb the water. Okay, but how does it get up? Well, as you absorb more water, pressure starts to build up, which kind of pushes it upwards. Okay? And water has this special property where it is very sticky. You don't think water is sticky, but water sticks to itself really well. That's how, that's how you have water droplets. Okay, you can have a water drop. 
you're not going to have like an alcohol drop or or gasoline drop. They don't coagulate in drops, but water does. This is because water attracts itself via cohesion. And water can stick to surfaces. And water sticks to windows, for example. It sticks to walls uh, via adhesion. So water likes to stick to stuff. As a result, water can pull itself up because it sticks to itself. Now, a really easy way to illustrate this is just go to the toilet, uh, rip off like a tissue paper, dip it in the toilet, and you will notice that the water will start to climb the toilet paper. It will go up. Okay, this is the same principle inside a tree. Water will go up because it sticks to itself and there's pressure on the bottom and slowly it pushes it upwards. And finally, at the leaves, uh, if you look at the picture at the top now, there are holes in the leaves, like we mentioned, um, the stoma. Water can escape the leaves, which is why water, um, well, the plants need to get rid of their leaves by wintertime. If they still have leaves, then you will lose a lot of water. So that's why leaves fall. Um, leaves will transpire the water, meaning that evaporate the water away from the plant so that there's lower pressure of water, which sucks more water up from beneath. Okay, so all three of these working together. The pressure from the roots as it sucks water, the stickiness, the cohesion and adhesion of the water as it sticks to the walls of the xylem as it goes up, as well as the transpiration of the water in the leaves where it evaporates so there's now an opening, uh, more water can fill that gap. So all three of these work against gravity to bring water to the top, okay? So yeah, that's a long process. We're going to have to go into details. So starting at the root, if you find a piece of root, you cut the root, that's the cross section. Okay, The roots uh, have a bit of a different structure than stems. And the roots have hair. Um, these little hairy, sticky things that kind of look like a virus, um, those are the root hairs, and water goes in through the root hair, it will go past a layer of cells into the middle, okay? It's like a coliseum. Um, into the middle is where the vascular bundle is. You have the xylem in the very center that forms an X shape, and the phloem surrounds the xylem. And if you look at this, uh, imagine this is a, sp a sports stadium or a coliseum. Um, those uh, seats around the stadium, th those are the cortex, okay? Let's uh, look at this in more detail. So again, um, what is what are you looking at? Well, this is part of a root. Look, here's a root. Imagine that you slice it like a pizza, okay, or you, you cut a slice of this out, and that's what you have. The middle stays, and you have this one slice. So this is, again, a cross section of the root. Those blue and red arrows are where the water is going, okay? They represent the path of the water. Uh, you can either go through the blue arrow, that means through the cells, or through the cell walls. If you just look carefully at those arrows, the blue arrows go through the cells, kind of like playing chess. You go through the little squares. Or you can go through the cell walls. You only travel within the wall. That's the red arrow, okay? Either way, they will make their way into the vascular bundle, which is the phloem and the xylem. Okay, that's basically all you need to know about transport in roots. Uh, roots will suck up water uh, from the soil. It will pass through the cortex, the middle part, and it will end up in the middle where the vascular bundle lies, the phloem and the xylem. So any questions so far? Okay. So once you're in the vascular bundle, you get sucked up into the stem. Okay, so we're now talking about the stem. So once the water reaches the xylem, okay, they're now called sap, okay, xylem sap. Plants have sap. And 
as more nutrients come in, more water starts to accumulate because you're sucking it up. So this creates root pressure, okay? As you accumulate more water, root pressure will push the, the sap upwards. Okay, does that make sense? As pressure accumulate, you, you have to push it somewhere and the only way to go is up because the water is coming in from the roots, it goes up. So that's the effect of root pressure building up in the roots in the stem which drives water to go up okay any questions all right so as you can see there are some words here like osmosis i'm not sure if you know that word um, i believe you talk about that in grade eight osmosis uh, in short is the movement of water to go uh, somewhere where there's fewer water Okay, if, if you eat potato chips, you're going to be very thirsty because after you eat potato chips, there's going to be a lot of salt in your blood. And you feel thirsty because you need more water to dilute that salt. Okay, Your blood is really lacking water if you eat potato chips. That's the idea of osmosis. The same thing, you eat some chocolate, uh, you get thirsty because there's lots of sugar in your blood and you're gonna want more water, okay? So water will go inside the plants because there's lots of stuff in the plant, lots of salt, lots of sugar, water will go in, okay? So once you go past the stem, you go up and you reach the leaves, transpiration occurs at the stomata. Okay, transpiration is simply evaporation of water through plant leaves. So if you look at the picture, you have a leaf, there's a hole, the, uh, the stoma, the stoma. Uh, water is actually escaping that. Okay, because water attracts itself, water really likes other water molecules. As you get out of the plant, more water will want to follow that water because they, again, attract the neighbors. So it's like something is pulling the water out of the leaf okay and then water all hooked onto one another so you pull the whole stream of water from the stem into the leaves again so you replace the water that is lost okay does that make sense so the molecules of water they pull each other out of the plant and this extends all the way down the xylem, all the way to the roots. So the transpiration at the leaves will further pull water upwards. So do we have any questions about uh, transpiration? Okay, so again, here's another picture that summarizes all of this. So when you study for this, um, this picture is probably the best one to look at. Um, it, it's numbered, okay? Number one, um, at the leaves, transpiration happens. Water escapes the leaves, which draws more water from the stem to replace it, okay? The tension will then suck more water into the leaves. And if you just follow the path, um, four, it pulls the water, uh, it pulls the water column upwards and outwards in the xylem of the veins and the leaves. So basically, you suck it in. Number five, you will suck more water from the stem upwards to replace the one that you've lost in the leaves. And then finally, from the roots, uh, because of adhesion and cohesion, you pull water from the roots, and the roots will then suck more water from the soil, generates pressure, and further pushes it up. So all of this combined. Okay, you need to know all three. What happens in the leaves, what happens in the stem, and what happens in the roots? How do they work together to pull water to the top? So that's the big picture. So that's how plants basically suck up water like a straw. Okay, they don't need a pump, they don't need a heart because they have these processes. Okay, so that's enough about water. Um, plants they don't just transport water. They also transport sugar. Okay, plants need sugar to survive. In fact, they make sugar from photosynthesis. So you can either be a sugar source or a sugar sink. What, what's the difference? Well, a source is you produce sugar. You're a source of sugar. 
a sink is you take sugars. So you're a sink for sugar, okay? A sugar source would be like a leaf. Leaves do photosynthesis. They make sugar, so that's the source of your sugar for your plant. And a sink uh, would be like a root, for example. Roots store sugars. So once sugar goes to the root, it's stuck there. It is stored in the root, so that's why they're a sink. So basically, sugars are made in the leaf. They are stored and used everywhere else in the plant, especially the root. And here, you realize that, wait, sugar needs to go down into the roots, okay? And also up from the roots when it is time to use that sugar. So sugar can move up and down the plant. It doesn't just go in one direction. It is made in the leaves. It goes into the root for storage. And once winter time comes, you don't have leaves anymore. Well, the sugar will come out of the root and go to everywhere else in the plant. All right, does that make sense? When sugars are produced, they move from source into a sink. Does that make sense? Any questions? All right, so it depends on the season. Um, right now, if you look outside, it is winter time. And during the winter, you do not have any leaves on the plants. So the trees, they're not doing photosynthesis at all. They're just sitting there. They're, they're living off of the sugar that they made last summer. Okay, it's like, actually, it's very much like right now, COVID. A lot of people lost their jobs due to COVID. Uh, they're living off of government paycheck, um, their savings. If, well, probably the government check, but let's say you forgot to apply. Well, if you have savings in the bank, you can just spend that. That's, that's basically plants in the winter because they're not making sugar. They're spending the ones that they have from their roots. So the roots now become the source. Okay, and the plant will withdraw sugar from the root to everywhere else in the body, kind of like people withdraw money from their savings account in the bank so that they can buy food with it. Okay, and that's for winter time and spring where you don't have leaves. In the summer, uh, plants, they have lots of leaves and they do photosynthesis, they make lots of sugar. And they don't need all of that sugar immediately, so they move it down into the roots to store. Okay, it's like when COVID is over, if it is over, uh, people go back to work, and they start to make money again, they start to deposit money back into the bank account. So once again, the leaves become the source and the roots become the sink. So during summer, sugar will go from the top of the tree to the bottom, from the leaves to the root, whereas winter, Sugars will go from roots to the tip of the tree. Does that make sense? I'm not getting any questions, so I'm, I'm going to assume that you guys understand what I'm saying. Okay, so that's it for the boring bits. So I understand that plants can be really dry and boring. There's nothing exciting. Uh, at least now we get to talk about sexual reproduction. Uh, plants, like animals, they can produce via sexual reproduction. That means you need a partner. Sperm and egg, you know, plants don't have sperm, they have pollen. Okay, that's the plant equivalent, the male gamete of the plant. They, they have eggs, um, they're hidden inside of seeds. So um, for plants, they need organs completely devoted to this process, just like Animals, we have sex organs. They do one thing, reproduce. Act, yeah, no, okay, they might have other functions like to pee, but plants, they don't need to do that. So they have one job, okay? They, the flowers of the plant will reproduce. That's the only thing that they're good for. So flowers are the reproductive organs of flowering plants. Not all plants have flowers. We're only talking about the flowering plants, which is like 90% of all plants. So most plants have flowers. Flower uh, produces pollen, which is plant sperm. And this 
a same flower, except at a different location, will produce eggs. Okay, so plants are a little bit different than people. Uh, if you're a person, you either produce sperm or egg, not both. Okay, plants, they produce both. I know what you're thinking. So can a plant reproduce with itself? Yes, it can. Okay, that is not sexual reproduction. Plants can basically just clone themselves, but they don't want to do that. Uh, organisms need variety. That means you need to reproduce with somebody else so that you mix your genes so you become something different. Okay, so plants need to find a partner. Um, not all plants have flowers. Like I said, um, the coniferous trees, like right now, look outside, you probably see pine trees. Those don't have flowers at all. You will never see flowers. Those are not flowering plants. Okay, so the idea of pollination is the same for plants as humans' uh, fertilization. Humans and animals, the sperms will fertilize the egg, you have a baby. Plants, the pollen will fertilize the egg and you have a baby, or a seed. Okay, that's pollination. Pollen meets the egg. Humans and other animals, we can go and find a partner. Plants, they can't exactly do that. They can't move, they can't talk, they can't interact, they're stuck. So they rely on other things in order for their pollen and their eggs to come together. They rely on animals, so their flowers attract animals like insects, birds, bats. They attract them using their smell, their color, and their nectar. They have some sweet stuff hidden within the flower, so these animals would then and go and try to drink that nectar. And then in, in the process, they rub pollen all over their bodies. So when they visit another flower, the pollen will fertilize that flower and repeat okay so that's the idea of pollination now um, there's also wind pollination you don't need an animal simply the wind blows my pollen onto another flower if you only rely on the wind your flowers are probably ugly okay ugly might not be uh, the best word to use here your flowers are not impressive okay? they don't jump out they're kind of small and you barely notice them at all because animals don't need to notice them. The wind will do that job. Whereas if you see a beautiful flower, like a red flower or a yellow purple that really stands out and it smells nice, yeah, they they are there to attract animals. Okay, We like flowers for a reason. We think flowers are pretty. We use them for special occasions because that's, that's what the point of a flower is, just to look pretty so that you like it. And once pollination occurs, the plants will then produce seeds. Contained within the seeds, you have a fertilized embryo, just like an embryo inside of a mother. Okay, Then that seed will germinate and make a new plant. So any questions regarding plant reproduction? So basically, I just told the love story between plants. That's like Romeo and Juliet plant style. Okay, so the baby, um, the seeds. What does a seed do? Well, number one, it protects the plant embryo inside. Okay, hidden within it is the baby. Second, it allows the plant to get the seed somewhere else to grow another plant. You don't want to have just to have a plant right beside yours. If you're a plant and you're going to make a baby plant, you don't want that plant near you, okay? Because you will fight for the same resources. If you're in the same patch of soil, guess what? You'd be fighting for water, you'd be fighting for minerals, you'd be fighting for all like sunlight. One will block the other's light and you'll be living in a shadow, which is bad for a plant. So no, that's bad. So plants ideally wants to get their seeds as far away from them as they possibly can. Okay, And there are multiple strategies for doing this. So the ability of a plant, uh, for a plant to disperse its seed, not just make one, it is also important. So quick question, how do plants disperse their seeds? Anyone, anyone know how that is done?
folks, um, either into the chat or to speak. Uh, by the wind. Okay, yeah, no, that does work. Yeah, some plants rely on the wind to blow their seeds somewhere else. Okay, what if it's not windy? Do they all rely on the wind? Look at the picture. Those two things. I don't think the wind will carry that pine cone very far. What else? Like, do they put them? Do they put the seeds in like different places? How? Like, who places the seeds into different places? Mm, not sure. Okay, hold on. Um, wind. Well, yeah, timer said the wind. Um, bird poop. Uh, bird poop. Yeah, bird poop is actually pretty harmful. Uh, they don't rely on bird poop. Animals carry, yeah, okay, animals. And then they poop, right. So animal poop. Um, bird poop is a little different. Birds, they piss and poo at the same time. Uh, bird, that thing that comes out of bird is their pee, technically, uh, mixed in with their poop. Yeah, that's disgusting. But yeah, normal animals, when they eat the seeds, they poop it out. And that's how uh, plants disperse. They rely on animals and the wind. Okay, so I don't know if you were, when you were a kid, if you ever picked up a dandelion and you blew on it. I know I did because the first time I saw those, I was like, wow, they're so pretty and fuzzy. So I just took one and started... And it was pretty. And then later, when I got older, I realized, wait a minute. By doing that, I'm killing the plant, right? Because I have to pick it up, which kills the plant. So I stopped doing it. Little did I know I was actually doing the plant a favor. The plant wants to be blown, okay? The plant wants something, like the wind or an animal, to blow its little seeds all across the field so that they will grow more. So that's actually a good thing if, if you see... Okay, we, you might not want the dandelion to reproduce, but if you really want to help it out, help it disperse the seed. Or you can rely on animals. Yeah, okay, your mother gets upset. With, yeah, because um, dandelions are usually uh, pests. Uh, if you have a garden, you don't want them. You want to grow whatever you're growing, not dandelions. So they're, they're like weeds. So if you actually disperse the seed, you're going to make baby dandelions the next year around. So yeah, those yellow little flowers you see on the side of the road, yeah, that's what happened. If you don't want to rely on the wind, well, animals will come and eat you. For example, fruits. Um, if you have an apple, animals come, swallow the apple, they poop out the seeds, and the animal probably moves somewhere. So wherever the animal poops is where that new plant will grow. Okay. And if you're a squirrel, uh, you, you get like an, an acorn or pine cone. Uh, you take it and you run around and you dig a hole, you put it in and you bury it. And then the squirrel looks to the left, the squirrel looks to the right, looks up, looks down. Okay. I think I remember what this is. Runs off. Okay, a few days later, squirrel comes back. Okay, where's my pine cone? Dig, oh, nothing. Dig, oh, nothing. And the squirrel lost it. So squirrels are pretty stupid. Um, a lot of times they bury something and they completely forget where they did it. And the plant will be like, yes, you idiot squirrel. Now the plant grows. Okay, so plants rely on the stupidity of animals. Um, any questions? Okay, now we're going to talk about fruits, and we're almost finished with the lesson. So, question, uh, which of the following are fruits? Okay, answer in the chat, please. You have a plum, a walnut, a pepper, a durian, a tomato, and a cucumber. And just type the name of the plant that you think is a fruit. Gabriella says all. So she casually just munches on pepper at lunch. Any other answers aside from that one? Okay, this isn't fun. Um, you guys are too smart. Uh, everyone so far says all. 
Okay, yes, all of the above are fruits. Um, I, I'm glad you know that. Fruits have seeds, okay? If you have seeds, you're, by definition, a fruit. So this settles the debate. Is tomato a vegetable or a fruit? Botanically speaking, um, it is a fruit because it has seeds in it, okay? Now, technically, a tomato is also a vegetable, what is the definition of a vegetable? Of the part of the plant that you eat is a vegetable. You do eat a tomato. Your tomatoes are plants. So therefore, tomatoes are vegetables. So it's both. Uh, you can be both. Okay, so all fruits are vegetables, but not all vegetables are fruits. So yeah, it, it's surprising what constitute a fruit. Like a pepper is a fruit, but we don't call it a fruit in everyday languages. Okay, scientifically speaking, these are all fruits, but we don't speak science on a daily basis. Common English has different definitions than science, okay, you, despite using the same word. So in normal English, a fruit here, that would be the plum, the during, and the tomato. The other three are not fruits according to common English, but according to science, they are all fruits. So here's the definition of a fruit. A fruit is the ovary of a flowering plant, which then contains the seeds. It's actually pretty disgusting if you want to draw a parallel with animals. Um, an ovary is the female reproductive organ. Um, for those that don't know what an ovary is, um, males, they have testicles. Females have ovaries and ovaries are inside of the uh, of the female whereas testicles are outside descended in the male so they're like female balls okay and by eating fruits yeah you're eating the ovary of that plant that flesh is the flesh of the ovary i hope i didn't ruin fruits but when you have a fruit okay inside the seed um, it, it has been fertilized by the pollen, and now it has an embryo. And then, in closing the seed, you have flesh called the pericarp. Now, this can be fleshy, like a peach, or dry, like a walnut, Okay, both of which are the pericarp. And that's what we eat. Okay, does that make sense? The fruit has multiple functions. A, it protects the seed. Um, B, it attracts animals. So question, the fruit is very sweet, okay? And it has a lot of sugar and nutrient, but that sugar and nutrients are not for the baby embryo. Who's that for? Anyone? Plants have to go through a lot of trouble to make sugar photosynthesis, and they put a lot of that sugar into a fruit. Why? Water. I'm not sure what that means. Uh, what do you mean, water? So basically, my question is, why are fruits delicious? Why do plants bother making the fruit so tasty? For respiration. Not exactly. Um, a respiration does need sugar, but you do it in every single cell that has a mitochondria, not just the fruit. Really? Nobody? Storing the glucose from photosynthesis. Yeah, not necessarily in the fruit because um, plants only produce fruit at very specific times. They still store the sugar without a fruit. It's for animals. Yes, now you're getting it. It's for the animals to eat. If your fruit tastes like crap, animals are not going to eat it. Okay, every time I, I take a bite of your fruit, I throw up. I'm sorry, you're never getting your seed dispersed. So you better make your fruit delicious so animals will come and eat the whole thing and walks a few miles and poops it out. You disperse the seeds. So that fruitiness, okay, that, that sweetness is for animals. Uh, so basically, by eating fruits, we are doing plants a favor. They, the fruits wants to be eaten. That's why it is sweet. If the plant doesn't want you to eat it, you will definitely know because 
if you try to eat anywhere else on that plant, it's going to taste disgusting. In fact, plants can produce nasty chemicals inside of their leaves to prevent things from eating it. But this, yeah, this is asking to be eaten. Does that make sense? And that's pretty much it about plant reproduction. So today we basically learn two things. One, plant transport. Okay, water goes from the roots into the stem, into the leaves. How? Because the roots will absorb water, building pressure. And also water attracts itself via cohesion. And it sticks to surfaces via adhesion so that water is able to pull itself up through the stem. Excuse me. And at the leaves, transpiration occurs, water evaporates from the leaves, Excuse me. And as it evaporates, it pulls more water from the stem. So this whole process moves water up the plant. Okay, And flowers are the plant reproductive organs. Not all plants have flowers. Only around 90% of all plants do. We call them flowering plants. If you do have a flower, uh, you know what it does. It is there for reproduction. It makes sperm and eggs pollen and eggs inside of plants and they rely on pollination in order to reproduce so bees birds bats butterflies they can all pollinate and once they do once the plant is pollinated then you will produce fruits okay and then the fruits are either eaten or they just drop by animals or blown away by the wind so that the plants can then grow a new one so that's pretty much it uh, for plants. Do we have any questions before we end it?